This is introduction to Freedom Kernels. Uh, yeah, let's go. So, who am I? Uh, I'm Sherrod. I'm from Fairfax, Virginia, around DC. I'm intern at 2.6 Technologies, do a lot of mobile stuff there. Uh, I kind of hate open source software after doing stuff in it. Uh, I don't like open source anymore. Uh, I occasionally contribute to LibAFL, which is a fuzzing library. Um, and according to Benjamin Brundage, who could have pulled up this year, this semester, but decided not to. Man, I hate that guy. I'm a fuzz cell, as he says. Um, go ask him about that. I don't know what he'll do about that. Um, okay, free to components. Uh, I think Sohel and uh, Chase touched on this a little, but there's two major components that exist in freedom kernels. There's free to core. So there's, <laughs> there's free to core, which is mainly used for process injection. Um, has, it has major has support for most major operating systems, Android, Linux, Windows, iOS, Mac OS, and QNX for some reason. Not sure why that exists, but it does. Um, it's usually used by as a stage one uh, by things such as free to server, which we used in the, in the last presentation. Um, and it injects shared libraries like free to agent. Um, free to gum, the free to gum is the in process component of free to. Um, it's tend to be used once the process, once it's actually injected into the process. Um, so, yeah, so I'll talk about it a little later, but free to, free to gum is mainly used when free to core has already injected something into the target process trying to be tampered with. Um, it allows for tampering, so a lot of the features that Soho and Chase talked about, stuff like Interceptor, Stalker, those are those all go through free to gum. Um, we'll go into those in a lot more depth here. Um, and exactly how they work. Okay. Uh, free to core, let's talk about it a little. Um, so I'm mainly talking about this free to core has a lot of components, but I'm mainly going to talk about the Linux injector, um, which is used to do cross injection on Linux. Um, so Linux, the Linux injector is mainly responsible for injecting shared libraries, which are the equivalent of DLLs in Linux, uh, into other processes. Uh, Linux injector is actually pretty complicated, mainly because Linux doesn't really have a dedicated process injection IP, I mean API. So like on Windows, you have stuff like create remote thread or you can create mappings in external processes. Um, for example, in, in Mac, you have stuff like VM, uh, VM allocate or VM read, VM write. But in Linux, you only have ptrace, which does basically nothing. You can read, write for memory, and you can read and write the registers. And that's basically all you can do. Um, so Frida is, is forced to use ptrace. Um, this leads to a lot of really creative techniques, which I'm going to hopefully touch on a little bit here. Um, the main creative technique I'm talking about is remote call, which is how Frida makes a call from a it's how Frida makes a call in another process. So let's say you're trying to call like printf in a foreign process. It makes that call via remote call, and that's pretty interesting. All right. So do you want to do a little bit of like walking through some code? Um, all right. So this is like the main entry point for Frida. No, it's terrible. What the? Yeah, so this is this is the main entry point for Frida Core. Um, this is inject library FD. This injects a shared object, so this 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 library SO, right there, into this PID right here, with some data and some features. Uh, that's all that does. Um, we'll talk about a little more about how it actually does the injection. Okay, um, so this is the actual inject function. So if you look back here, there it calls inject library. Um, inject library ultimately reaches here. Um, this is actually where the fun begins because there are a few important things that exist in Frida. Um, so there's two when you're actually injecting into something. There's two there's two stages essentially. There's the bootstrap stage and then the load stage. Um, the bootstrap stage is, uh, right, one second. Also, this is, written, this is written in Vala, which is actually a language that transpiles to C. So when you compile it, it essentially turns itself into C, and then the C is then compiled. Um, Vala is basically object-oriented C, as far as I understand, which is C++, but not really. It's, it's confusing. I don't know. 
Um, yeah. It's got helpers, um, bootstrapper. So this is, this is the first main, main part. Um, this is a lot of important things. For example, uh, it, the main thing it does really is it mmap space for the, the loader. Um, so that is essentially creating some memory so the loader can be loaded, the, the stage two can be loaded in. And it resolves some libc APIs, I think. Yeah. Um, so to do stuff like it'll resolve DL sim, DL open, a lot of these, a lot of these APIs. So DL, like, yeah. DL open, DL sim, it gets stuff like um, libp thread, p thread create, and p thread detach, which are used later. Um, yeah, that is, that's, that's what the, the bootstrap does. Um, the loader is actually what creates and loads the shared object, the shared library we're trying to inject. Um, the loader is actually really simple. All it does is it um, it DL opens your so DL open by the way if you don't know DL open is a library call that essentially opens a library in another in a process. Um, so for example, let's say you need to use I don't know libc for example. You don't, you don't have libc in your current uh, process space. You can DL open libc and then you can use libc using DL open. Um, DL sim finds a symbol, so it's a function, so for example, printf, in the library that you just opened. Um, so what it'll do is it'll deal open that library and then find the agent handle, which is actually the, the function we're trying to call within that target process. Um, and all it does is it just calls that, that agent. And then at that point, you're in the target process and you're running whatever you want to run. Okay, guys, any questions on that before I move on? All right. Okay, um, so that's what inject does at a very high level. Now, one thing I do want to uh, talk about in depth, just because I think it's really cool, is remote call. What's remote call? So again, remote call is how you actually make a call to a, you make a function call within another process. Um, so remote call has, uh, where's remote call? Remote call builder, there we go. So remote call execute, okay. Um, so, yeah, okay, so, okay, as a little context for remote, <laughs> all right, so a little context for remote call. Um, so in Linux, you can actually catch signals. Um, there's stuff like signal handling. So for example, so there's a bunch of signals you can catch. I think there's only one signal you can't catch, maybe two. The main you can't, the main one you can't catch is sig kill. But every other signal you can catch, including seg faults. Believe it or not, you can actually catch seg faults. Um, and you can handle seg faults. Should you handle seg faults? Probably not, but you can if you need to. Um, and that's actually how Frida does it. Um, so, a little context here. Target address, in this case, is going to be our the function we're trying to call. Um, so I'm going to go over x86-64, because that's where we're working. Um, so when you're calling functions, you obviously have a bunch of arguments. So what it'll do is it'll... It'll set up these arguments. Um, so the first argument goes in RDI. Second argument goes in RSI, RDX, RCX, RA, and R9. This is the state. Yeah, what's up? Six stop is another signal. Is it actually six stop? Yeah, it just like calls the stop. That makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So this this right here is the standard Linux calling ABI. Um, these are this is a standard register order that you see. If you're reverse engineered in Linux binaries, you're probably very familiar with this uh, with this idea. So and this really just sets up the registers and sets up the arguments for the call later. Now, this is actually pretty cool. This subtracts eight from RSP and stores a dummy return address. This is just a bullshit value, and it stores that bullshit value at RSP. Um, that was actually pretty nice. So what this does. That sucks. Um, so what this is actually doing is essentially emulating the call instruction. So the call instruction, what that does is it jumps to a particular address in memory and it um, it jumps to a particular address in memory and it pushes the return address onto the stack. Um, so that's exactly what that's doing, actually. 
um, because it's it's push it's subtracting eight, which is what push does, and storing our return address onto the stack right there. Uh, so essentially, what we've done is we've emulated the call instruction with a dummy return address, and we'll see how that dummy return address is used. The reason it's called a dummy return address or contact is because this address doesn't exist. It's guaranteed not to exist. Um, if you ever try to jump to this address, this off three twenty address right here, it will set fault pretty much all the time. Um, I don't think there's any, there's a case where it's never going to set fault. Um, okay. So, dumb return address is here. Okay. So, this is all code for different architectures. So, this is MIPS. That's ARM64, and that's uh, regular ARM. Um, okay. So, at this point, it'll set the program counter. So, this is in x86, this is going to be RIP. It's going to set it to the target address, which is the function we're trying to call. Um, yeah, so, okay, so it's gonna, it's gonna set the registers, all these registers that we, we just set up, it's gonna set them, and then it's going to resume the actual process, and that's gonna wait for signals, it's gonna wait for seg fault specifically, or seg, or seg stop. Um, if it, so the key here is that if it's seg faults, then we've probably hit this dummy return address, which is kind of the key of how it actually knows when to stop. So it, it makes the call, and then once it hits that seg fault, it knows that the call is done. And then it re and then it restores the registers right here, and then it's done. That's it. Um, that's how it makes a remote call. Uh, does that make sense? Okay, I talked a little bit, a little, I talked about this at RCR a little bit, um, but yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's that, that's pretty much what I want to talk about with three to four. Um, yeah, that's process injection. So it could it uses those remote calls a lot to do stuff like M mapping, probably DL opening as well. Um, mainly M mapping. Those is the main thing it uses it for. Um, yeah. Okay. Frida gum. Um, Frida gum is the other component of Frida that's used once you're injected into the process. Frida gum is going to be used to actually tamper with the process, do stuff like stalking, intercepting, etc. Um, yeah. So, so and Chase talked about this a little, but Frida Gum has a few key components. Uh, interceptor is one of the big ones. Um, I like to hook and replace functions. Uh, we'll talk about it a little later. Uh, stalker. I'm not going to talk about this here, but talk to me if you want to learn about this. I do a lot of this stuff. Uh, stalker is mainly used for code tracing. Uh, so we'll talk about this a lot. Um, use a lot for fuzzing. Uh, code writer. Code writer is a feature in Free that you don't see very often, but it's still very useful. It allows you to do code overwriting very easily. Um, it's used significantly in Interceptor and Stalker. Uh, yeah. I don't think I talked about I talk about that a little later. I'll talk about it a little later. Um, relocator. Relocator allows you to take code from one part of the process and, well, I guess one part of memory and place it in another part of memory without changing the actual effect of the instruction. So, for example, let's say you have this move RAX, RIP plus this aux F68. Right, so this instruction is RIP dependent, so it is important. So it it matters where this where in memory this instruction actually executes. Um, now you can't actually see the bottom, but that sucks. Okay, um, so let's do that. There we go. Ah, oh, that's not help. There we go. Um, so. Because it depends on where that process, where it actually executes in memory, um, if you're trying to move that instruction to another part of memory, which is used a lot in Stalker, um, how you actually execute that instruction needs to change. So what you're going to do, what Stalker does, at least what I think it does, is it replaces it with a move RDI RIP plus uh, F68. Um, so this RIP is going to be the RIP where it's supposed to execute. It moves that value into RDI and then moves um, from RDI into RIX, and that emulates the exact same behavior as it was there. If the concept of relocate doesn't really make much sense, that's okay. We'll talk about it when I get into the demo. Okay. Um, code writer. I talked about this a little bit, but code writer, pretty simple. It, it, it allows a really good API to just write assembly instructions, really. Um, it allows you to do things that are like you otherwise can't really do in one instruction. Stuff like uh, moving immediates into registers. Um, so for example, let's say you want to move a 64-bit value into a register in ARM. Um, that's impossible in ARM in one instruction. So CodeWriter allows you 
provides a really, really easy way to do that. Um, and it just handles everything for you. So CodeWriter is a really nice feature to do that. Um, yeah. CodeWriter is mainly used, I guess, outside of the Interceptor and Stalker. It's mainly used for code overwriting. So let's say you have this piece of code, this piece of assembly code that you want to patch. Um, CodeWriter will allow you to patch it very easily. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, OK. So here is a, here's an example of a code right here. OK. Um, this is x86. Wrong one. OK. This is an example of the x86 code writer. Um, this sets up an argument list. So this is the context for this is mainly, let's say you want to call a function. Um, and actually, I'll show you the context for it. It's a good example here. Yeah. So let's say you want to call, um, let's say you want to call a function here. The function is at this address. It has this number of arguments, and you have a number of arguments here. Uh, so this function, what it'll do is it will actually move those values that you're trying to, you're trying to actually, you're trying to move, so you're trying to move these arguments into their proper registers is what's going to, what that's going to try to do. Um, so what this does is it essentially emits a bunch of nice instructions here. Where the hell are there we go. So what this does is it essentially goes through every instruction and, where is it? Yeah. So it goes through every single argument and moves it into its proper register. So for example, it'll move the first arguments into RDI in the case of x86, a second argument to RSI, the third argument to RDX, et cetera, et cetera. And it will emit instructions for all of that right here. So for example, let's say the arguments is a address that you want to pass in, what it'll do is it'll emit a move instruction that moves that value, the value right here, into this register that we have. Um, so for example, yeah. Um, yeah, for example, let's say we have some, uh, I don't know, some address for some structure that we want to access later. <coughs> that will move this address into the proper argument register that we need to use. I don't know if that makes sense. Does that make sense? <laughs> Fair enough. OK. Yeah. Um, I think it'll make sense when we get into GDB, once we get into GDB. Because uh, a lot of that, you see a lot of that stuff in GDB. Um, OK. So this is for ARM specifically. So for ARM, it's impossible to move. Uh, it's impossible to move a 64-bit value into a register in one instruction. Um, so ARM, I guess the ARM code writer has a few ways to do that. So what to replace it with is it will replace um, your move with a, oh god, how do I explain this? Um, it'll, it'll replace your, it'll replace like a move with a load from, it'll replace a move with a load. So it'll put that, that value you want into memory and it'll load that value from memory instead of just moving it directly, because that's impossible. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, this is a relocator. Um, there's a few examples of how the relocator works. Okay. Um, yeah. So the relocator again, what that does it is is it um, wrong. Yeah, what the relocator essentially does is it moves, um, how do I, yeah. So it allows you to move an instruction from one part of memory to another part of memory. So for example, in ARM, a BL is equivalent of a call um, to a, I guess, a PC relative offset. Um, so, for example, let's say you have, I don't know, like BL. Let me just pull it up on Godbolt. No, I'm not going to pull it up on Godbolt. Um, yeah, so a BL is just the equivalent of a call. That's not to register. Um, so a normal call to a normal function. Um, but the problem is that call instruction is dependent on where it's located in memory. Um, so if you move that, 
call, you're going to need to change how you actually write that that register on how you write that call uh, instruction. Um, and what it turns into is it turns into two instructions. So it moves the actual call target into this LR register, this link register, and then it just calls the link register directly down here. Um, so that allows you to make the call um, while being another part of memory, which is very confusing. I think it's, I think I, yeah, I found this to be very confusing initially. Um, but yeah, that's what that does. Um, for X8, there's also an X86 example. Um, same thing, relocates an unconditional branch in X86. Um, why? So, oh god. Um, okay. Okay, um, so this is, an, this is how you rewrite an unconditional branch. Um, so for example, an unconditional branch is just a branch that doesn't have a condition attached to it. So that branch will always trigger, it's not a conditional. Okay, so for example, a call is considered to be an unconditional branch. So if it's a call, what it'll do is it does the exact same thing. So it pushes uh, RAX, push, what is it doing here? Oh wait, that's what it does. So this, what this is doing is it's saving RAX, I think, and then moving PC into RAX, and then swapping. Yeah, I don't really know what's going on here, to, to be frank with you. Uh, <laughs> I don't really know what's going on here. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I think what this is doing is it's pushing RAX onto the stack, and then moving, I think, what is this, PC? I think that's the, yeah. Where? Wait. Man. Wait. Oh, that's where it is. My bad. Oh my god. Okay. So <laughs> Okay. So this is actually this is actually where it's happening. So what all this is doing is it replaces the call that might be PC relative and it replaces it with a call address. And a call address should be Yeah, so it just relocates that um that call. Which is weird to say, but yeah, I don't know. Okay, I'm just gonna end the demo because I'm just confusing myself at this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, I right, let me talk about interceptor real quick before you end the demo. Um, interceptor uses code writer and relocator a lot. Um, so interceptor has a few features. Let me go to the free API here. Um, um, okay, so the interceptor, where the hell is it? Where are you? There it is. Okay, so the interceptor will allow you to attach to a target, to a target function, and then allow you to run two callbacks on it. The on, this, is the, this is the JavaScript API. <laughs> okay, so it runs two callbacks. So the first callback is the on enter callback. That on enter callback. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Okay, guys. All right. All right. I'll talk to you after this time. Okay. All right. So we got the, so the on enter callback <laughs> runs whenever the function is that whenever the function enters the on enter callback runs. And the on leave callback will run whenever the function returns. Um, so this is just a really good way to hook functions uh, because it allows you to call, just see values when they enter and see values when they leave. <laughs> that is way too funny. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that's what that does. Okay. The way it does it is it overwrites the, the it doesn't actually write overwrite the last part, but it overwrites the first part of the function with a trampoline that actually jumps into the Frida handler. And we'll see what that does in the, I'm not gonna walk through this code actually. Um, I'm not walking through this code. I said I was gonna do it, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. You could not pay me to do that. 
which is not useful. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Alright. Man, this is a this is a quality. <laughs> That's for your demo. There we go. Uh alright. Okay, so just cap Frida got an example here. Um so this is actually this is Frida in C. Not in JavaScript. Um, so yeah, this is a little complicated. But what this is doing is this is attaching to the open call, um, just like the standard file open call. Um, and then, so the listener it uses is this listener right here. Um, so it'll hook. So if open is called, then it'll um, yeah, it'll just print out the first argument in hook. I guess the first argument of open. And if close is called, I'll print out the first argument of close. Um, yeah. And then on leave, it does nothing. Yeah. So, so if I run this, so open is called, so open and close are both called, I guess, twice. Well, yeah, both open and close are called twice. They're called two times more here just to show that once the interceptor is detached, um, the these are never going to run. I guess rather these functions aren't going to be hooked. So if I run this, we should get exactly four callbacks because one for this close, one for this open, one for this close, one for this open, so four. Uh, so if I run this, um, we get four, yeah. So we get the, the first open is for Etsy hosts, which we see up here, um, see Etsy hosts up here. This, then we close it, then we get the open for Etsy fstab, and then we close that as well, we get four. All right, let's see what is actually going on here. And GDB. All right. So let me just uh, let me disassemble open real quick. So this is what open is supposed to look like by default. Not very fun, but pay attention to this 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 top value right here. This is just a standard prologue right here. This is going to be overwritten. We're going to see that very shortly. That's all going to be overwritten. And okay, so actually, it's not too. Let's get rid of that one. Um, okay, so by going to this one, so we see that if I disassemble open now, actually, real quick. We can see that it's changed now. This top is now changed. So instead of having that, that NVR64, we have this jump, which jumps to our Frida handler, which we later use to actually run our on enter and on read hook. Okay, so here's what that does. Um, so if I actually do the context here. Um, okay, so this goes here. Uh, that goes there. This push pushes the address of the function we just came from, actually. Um, let me jump to this. this. These instructions right here are actually, um, let me just push a bunch of registers. This is saving the register state of the actual, um, of the actual function state. Um, and the reason for this is because when we actually go into um, when we actually go into the interceptor hook, the, all these registers are going to change. So we need to be able to restore them before we actually return to the actual program. And that's why we save them all here. Keep going. Um, just a bunch of stuff there. X, oh, FX save is there as well. Um, yeah. So at this point, now we've entered Frida Gum territory. So this is uh, Frida, this is Gum function begin invocation. I'll show what that is real quick, actually. Um, not actually what's happening. Um, okay, so there's a lot of there's a lot going on here, but 
but the key there's a few key parts of this that I want to highlight. Um, the first key part is this uh, next hop thing. So this next hop thing will actually allow it to return to where it originally was. Um, I guess I'll, I'll I'll show you what the next hop thing actually is. But what it does is because we overwrote instructions from when we so because we overwrote instructions in open, this uninvoked trampoline will actually it this uninvoked trampoline contains those instructions we overwrote. So it'll jump to the uninvoked trampoline and run those instructions and then jump back to the original open implementation. The second thing that matters is, um, where is it? Yeah, call a write address. So this will actually overwrite the return address of the function. And it will actually, instead of returning to where it was originally, it will return to our on leave trampoline, our on leave function. And we'll see that as well. Okay, so yeah. So we should see, let's set a breakpoint here actually. So we'll see that we did it ran our hook right here, so we see the open, the open uh, the hook thing that we saw earlier, and now we're outside. Now we've left. Um, so we'll see that keep jumping. This pops all the registers we just saved um, earlier. At this point, we're going to return to our trampoline. So we see that in our original implementation of open, we had these instructions, right? We overwrote these instructions, so we still need to, we still need to actually, um, yeah, we still need to run them and we, uh, because these instructions are necessary for the actual implementation of the function. So we jump to this, run these, um, these instructions, and then jump back to open. And now we've, we're basically cleanly out of Interceptor, and then we're back into here. Now if we look at the return address right here, that's a, yeah, that's the return address. If we look at the return address right here, closely, we set a breakpoint here. This is our, this is actually our on leave trampoline that we saw here. Um, so we set that, that did nothing, what the hell? Um, what? Why is, it, why is it stuck in single step? All right. That's cool. All right. That's okay. <coughs> all right. So at this point, now we're going to jump back to our on lead trampoline. Um, we'll do that. At this point, now we go back into this push FQ. We start saving our registers. Keep going, we keep going, we keep going. I think I'm going to go past it. No, we go past it. And then we call gum function context and invocation. And that will actually run, if you go to our uh, free to gum implementation here, that will actually run, if you go, our on leave callback right here. And that's how um, interceptor is actually handled. Um, pretty clean. Uh, leaves very little trace. In terms of detection, you really just need to look for... The nice thing about Frida is that Frida doesn't actually change the code size. Um, like, it, it doesn't actually expand the code. It doesn't, like... It, it's it essentially in process. Um, how do I explain that? There's some pieces of... Uh, there's some hook libraries that will actually literally expand the code and add more code. That'll actually handle the hook. But Frida just overwrites memory which is actually very advantageous. So that makes it much harder to detect in a lot of cases, um, which is really nice. Yeah. Anything else? Um, that's much all I have, actually. Any questions on that? It's not all over the place. Yeah. Let's say you needed a uh, spot to write all of this information down. Yeah. Do you know uh, what kind of thing you need to do? Um, I can't say that. Okay, yeah, I don't know. 